for your South Shore. When do landlords migrate through across the Mississippi River? Is that correct? When do landlords migrate through across the Wisconsin Shore of Lake Superior? That's one specific question. Yeah. So when do we want to, we're doing some business as airs, or however we want to call it airspace, so we have some actual movements. Well, um, through the airspace, So this is a collisions question, right? I mean, this is a, is that what this Basically, is? Basically, yeah. to propose questions of if we're going to develop wind turbines off the Apostle Islands. And are we, I have a, I have a question, um, are we focused on over land or are we looking at mm. offshore a little bit? Like when I think of islands, I'm both. thinking of offshore too. It has to be both. Is, is there a risk of off offshore development up here for the wind industry? I thought they mainly had identified the the ridges on the Bayfield Peninsula. Uh, that one was in question too. Yeah. I think it's going to depend more on when they determine uh, how to put turbines in deep water. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There are already some in the well, Mediterranean and off the coast of Norway that are floating, you know. So they could use that kind of technology here in the Great yeah, Lakes. Well, the park. <clears throat> protects the islands in a quarter mile, but we don't have any authority over over anything, you know, in between the islands more than a quarter mile from from the boundaries. So our assumption then with is so with the wind farms the assumption the assumption is that, that these are both onshore and offshore. That that, that 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 that's a possibility. I think the onshore threat is more immediate because right. I think if you looked at the wind industry maps, I'm the Bayfield right Peninsula has been identified. Yeah, so I think what we're missing here, and I actually mentioned this, you know, I, I, you know, I mean, some of us are local, but the context here, I mean, how much short, yeah, we, have, we haven't gone over kind of the context of the Lake Superior Shore. Everything we talked about this morning was kind of this big picture, large scale kind of thing. And that. yet, well, here we are to uh, develop questions and objectives specific to the small scale. <laughs> you know, we haven't even talked about what that small scale is. So you're, you're dealing with only, what is it, got 100 and... 25 miles of shoreline or something. I mean, that's how much. From Duluth to Ireland. Yeah, I mean, somewhere but, in that ballpark. Not is, not counting all the not islands. The shoreline yeah. Ireland. But yeah. in a regional sense, this is germane to the whole UP also. You know. Oh, yeah, sure. but that's not what we're supposed but, to do. Yeah. Well, true. Yeah. I, I agree. But, it, but it should be transferable. I was just gonna say, could it be transferable? I mean, this is the first thing. So. Group yeah, group. I mean, it can be transferable. I mean, you're, although you know, the focus for our grant is the western shore of. Lake Superior, Wisconsin. Its elements should be transferable. So don't limit yourself just to Yeah, it's just it's it's harder to plan at that scale. I mean, sure, you can come up with protocols and other things that you could easily expand beyond. But you, you know, answering questions at that scale, honestly, is just kind of awkward. So then, would this would this satisfy us for now? So one of our assumptions. We plan this out as a group is that we're, while we're only addressing 125 miles of shoreline, what we're talking about could be portable to other regions of Long Lake Superior. Yeah, because the methods and techniques are going to be similar. Or, or would we envision that what we're building out needs to be placed within that context? Would, would we say, well, we can we can only get so far in addressing this aspect of the question? We need our partners in the UP well, and Minnesota. Yeah, I mean, health. if we're going to talk about wind, really the main issue at least semi-imminently on the south shore of Lake Superior is the Bayfield Peninsula. I mean, that's where the wind development potentially may be. So then we would start to address monitoring as it relates to that specific threat. But if we're talking about the whole Lake Superior, you know, if we're gonna start including Michigan and everything, now you start taking all these other things into, into well, play. Well then let's try this. Within, this re within these 125 miles of shoreline, what are the greatest and most eminent threats to airspace? What are the most likely sources of collisions for birds moving through. Well, what is the greatest development of pressure? Does anyone know whether towers? there's any 
potential for communications tolerance. Oh, yeah. Well, we already have issues with you know some of that present, and it's it's increasing. And it seems like whenever they put up a tower, it's on some you know high ridge along the shore, you know. <laughs> And we already have some of that. Julie lives a stone's throw from a 600-foot tower. The radio one. I mean, it's it's a 600-foot, you know, not it's four miles inland. We just measured it was 600. It's 600-foot guide communication tower that sits on a two to three hundred-foot ridge. So effective height is almost pushing a thousand feet. You know, could another one of those pop up? Maybe. What I would add to this is um, because we have to come up with protocol, I would first ask, does the protocol differ when we're talking about a radio tower versus, versus a huge communication tower? Good point. And, and maybe it doesn't, um, and, or maybe it does, but the other, the other thing I would bring up is if we're coming up with protocols that we want to use over time, who knows, 10 years from now, it, maybe we won't even put wind turbines in. It might be something else that we don't even know of. Or maybe Ashton will grow into this big metropolis and we'll have like condos like right on the shore. I mean, who knows? You know? Um, that's true. So, that's well, the true. other, you know, even with techniques, you think of that. And, so, you true. know, some of the radar, some of the acoustic related stuff just wasn't possible even 10 yeah. years ago. And, so, and that's a good thing to keep in mind too. So, once we, when we come technology up with technology, or I'm sorry, when we come up with techniques now, making sure it's standardized. So 10 years from now, someone can come back and let's understand what we did with the technology we had mm -hmm. and be able to use it hopefully. Okay. I think I would be very careful about having the tail wag the dog. I think if you're talking about perceived threats, therefore we're gonna monitor with respect to those perceived threats. I think if one just goes out to find out what are birds doing right. in the atmosphere? Right. Where are they going? Where are they, where are they not? And then it doesn't matter. You haven't chased down what's a potential site here, unless you're going to become an environmental consultant to be to, to do that. I think that I'd be very careful about doing that. I think if you have 125 miles of coastline and you're worried about uh, what happens, where are the birds as they're arriving? Are there? I'd want to know spatial heterogeneity. If you try to predict where there's going to be a tower or a wind turbine, you're going to miss some potential areas where birds are. So I guess for me, I would say I would want to know where birds are arriving from, where they're going to in this area, and how they're using areas once they're in this space for a while, once they're in their yeah. purview. And then it doesn't, you're not biasing where you're going to work. Because that's that's not a good thing unless you're you know targeting a particular project concern, but that from what it sounds like this this is not like the wind energy migration monitoring network. It's the Midwest whatever it's called migration monitoring. Network. Yeah, I guess so, I feel like you need both layers of that. You know, if you have like an imminent yeah. a, a semi imminent project, you're I'm a semi imminent threat. You know, but I think when you're talking about scale. It should get down to what do you need to know for being for being a resource manager in this area, and that's not going to make a difference of whether you're talking about an invasive species, uh, shoreline development, wind tower, or communication tower, or wind wind turbines, because you're you're going to be, you know, you're going to need the same information for all of that stuff. Right. So I think, in my opinion, I would want to just get a, a, an idea of where are the birds, and not try to say where are areas of concern, unless you have that concern, we, which started us, as I said, we had to focus on Mid Coast Maine for a reason. But now it's everything, we just want to know go from Maine. Based on your question, I think it's a good one. I think maybe we can gain more traction if we start with question number two. Um, during spring and fall migration, what habitat says, because if, remember, Cam's got a group of land managers that want to, they want to go out and do good things for birds. They want to do, they want to pay attention to providing for birds during the migratory period. And we're trying to get out ahead of them to provide guidance and help take advantage, you know, the fact that they are ready and willing to go commit resources to this, let's try and help coordinate them and make sure that the direction they go in will be linked with and, and helpful for answering questions at larger scale. So, so maybe, maybe that's a tough nut to crack 
off the bat, maybe we can try this exercise, see where we can get with this question, and then come back and apply it to the first I guess I think this is a tougher nut to crack yeah. myself because, well, you know, like I've said before, it's a habitat quality issue here. It's not habitat quantity, and the habitat quality issue is a subtle one. It's not like this forest is crap and this forest is awesome. It's more closer to a level playing field. Not to say there aren't some differences, but they don't seem to me to be as extreme, and I think Anna's data supports that idea. Uh, she can correct me if I'm wrong. Do we have enough studies to support that? Well, no. Well, I guess. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, so, do you have short term and long term goals falling out here? In other words, you have to start somewhere, right? right? You're trying to develop a short term plan. What are you going to do? So, what techniques and where to apply them? It seems like that's. And what's going on now, and what are the data gaps? Yeah. So, yeah. What I was going to add to the habitat, um, and you mentioned it's quality versus quantity, which I would agree with, but I would also say that um, when we define habitat, maybe we're not just talking about vegetation, maybe we're talking about a coastal habitat versus a non-coastal, or a riparian versus non-riparian, which that could be quality and quantity too, mm -hmm. but I don't think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think there's much information about that here at all, really. There's been some, like you said, Apostle Island and Dave Winkler did some work here, um, but I mean, I no, guess I, I agree with that. And a lot of there's a lot of data gaps. And um, so I mean, we basically get to start from ground zero and set well, up a protocol. <coughs> Way back when, when there was a workshop you know, developing the stopover models, everybody got together and said, you know, riparian corridors are great for these birds. You know, they hit the lake shore and they funnel into these all these tributaries that dump into Lake Spirit. That was just kind of expert opinion, <laughs> right. you know. So there, to me, is a great hypothesis that you could test, you know, in the context of this question, yeah. is to set something up that answers that question. Is that truly oh, higher how quality? Important, how important yeah. Are yeah. 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 That would be a great short-term goal. Let's set up a network that would help validate the stopover models. That well, Kim said something about the stopover models not needing validation somewhere. Do you yeah, remember? Well, maybe you would say it. He, he says they do. Well, for, the, for Lake Superior, she said that he ditched his Lake Superior model because everything came out as high. So there was no validation to be done mm -hmm. on Lake Superior. I don't know, ask him because I just asked her about that the other day. So do you have land cover maps, land use maps already for this area? We've got, yeah. based on, based on peer reviewed literature and some expert opinion, um, they've identified areas of low, medium, high quality. Not with my migration, I'm just saying have land use or habitat types. Yeah, it's mapped out. Yeah. So yeah. What I showed there, and then when you, what do you need to know based on that? Because those data exist, right? Where are the birds with respect to that? And then what? Are, what are those habitats? How do you rank them as high value, low value? Or I wouldn't. I don't care for that ranking personally because, uh, to, it may not provide food, but it may save their life. That's a pretty high value. So I'd like to use the purpose, type of. Um, a way to describe the different habitats than, than that? I mean, surely we can all envision what's high value and low value, but I think putting them into purpose would be better because if you are trying, if you're asked to allocate funds to put into conserving this piece of land or that piece of land, and you just called that a low value habitat, I can tell you, then that's not going to get purchased. But that could be a critical habitat for arriving birds. It makes a difference to whether 30% of your migrants survive to go inland. Or not. So I guess I guess I would want to know if I had an idea what the a land use map was or a land cover map was available there, you know, Landsat maps, and say, okay, where do we expect to find migrants? Is that where we find migrants? So where are migrants? And that means point counts, and then or banding, and then go out and find the association of those migrants with those particular. Would you just put point counts in the predicted pie, or would you scatter them? Oh, the no, way? why? Because no data are data. Okay. I mean, where there are a few birds, it's just it's as valuable, valuable as whether there's yeah. 5,000 birds. So, because you'd want to know that. But and are just, they stopping there because it's a good spot to be open to resources, or is it just, oh my god, I need to rest, but there's no That would there. be the next step. Okay, what what are they doing there? How long are they staying there? And then, so maybe banding or re color banding, reciting becomes a tool. Um, and I guess what I'm getting at is the idea that because of the geographical aspect of it uh, and the contiguous nature of the habitat, that in many cases birds are just dumping based on some geographical component. 
and then you would think, okay, how are they moving then on the landscape to get to the good places? Those good places don't readily jump out at me, you know, in terms from an right. anecdotal right. birder so kind of birder. perspective. Right. So but, we're in this 125 mile coastline. Where are birds arriving most? Well, it's an east-west oriented shoreline. Yeah. Uh, in spring migration, those birds are hitting that east-west wall and then you know either dumping right out or moving you know parallel to the shore. Spring and moving north. Right? And yeah, so yeah. then yeah. they're spreading out in that way. So they're getting dripped all along the whole thing, or maybe any uh, you know geographical you know north oriented peninsulas like Whitefish Point or, or yeah. something of that nature. Um, and then in the fall, I think it's more unknown because you know most of them are going past Hawker Ridge and down the North Shore and funneling down the shoreline. But then you get a good number of them coming over Lake Superior. They hit the Apostle Islands and they're like, holy crap, we got to find a place to land. So do you know well, that the, migrants. the spatial distribution of birds aloft? We don't what, based on what no. No, I mean, the birds are coming down like the Minnesota shore or, or the ones that fly over the lake are flying over the lake and hit, hitting the island and especially the outer and funneling down that way and coming, coming down and once they hit outer, I think they scatter. You think?